And I found all of those qualities in a woman who grew up right here in Oakland. The daughter of immigrants who overcame every daunting obstacle and went on to achieve the highest levels of the American dream. So that is why I'm so proud to introduce to you the next Vice President of the United States, my fellow lawyer, a brilliant scientist, technologist, a fierce warrior mom, Nicole Shanahan. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Nicole Shanahan, the recently announced independent vice presidential candidate. She was just elected by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to run alongside him as the independent running for president and then her as vice president. The real question, though, with this campaign, it's gotten the Kennedy campaign back in the public eye and is getting them talked about again. Does RFK Jr. even stand a chance in the general election? And if not... Well then, the million dollar question is, does he take more votes from Biden or does he take more votes from Trump? We're going to be discussing the background of Kennedy and Shanahan and answering those questions today on Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. America is no longer one nation under God. Are you ready to fight for a revival? Well then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. As we get started, I'll just say the uh, way we're going to do this video is we're going to go through a brief rundown of RFK's policy positions, give you a brief background of Nicole Shanahan, his new vice presidential candidate, why he picked her, and then the question, does he help Trump or Biden more? We're going to look at some polling and see which way that seems to be going right now. Okay, so we're going to start off with some questions about the Robert F. Kennedy campaign, his positions on things, and that is, we'll start first with the economy. Okay. So here's, this is taken straight from the website, Kennedy24.com. So let's see. Um, he says that Kennedy does not accept that life will slowly get worse. We can restore the American middle class by reversing the missteps of the last 50 years. Moving on and on, more than 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck with no savings for an emergency. Sounds like a personal finance problem. Take-home pay after inflation and taxes has fallen 9% since Biden took office. Under the Biden administration, the price of an average home has risen from $250,000 to around $400,000. That's just insane. And you think that's just the average. Remember, that's not counting places like California where the median home price is somewhere around $700,000 to $750,000. It's insane. Mortgage rates have more than doubled. <clears throat> Rents have followed the trend, putting more and more people on the edge of catastrophe. But we can turn it around, says the Kennedy campaign. Being able to afford a decent life doesn't mean more working, working more hours. It means higher pay and lower bills. Here's what Kennedy will do to make that a reality, and he lists several things. Raise the minimum wage to $15, which is the equivalent to the 1967 level. I may have mentioned it before on the show, um, but the idea of a federal minimum wage in and of itself is unconstitutional. Um, I think based on if it doesn't violate the state's constitutions, it's not unconstitutional for a state such as Virginia to set their own minimum wage. I don't like the idea really, but I can see where there's some uh, ambiguity as to whether or not the states can do it, and most states do have it. Um, but the federal minimum wage is currently $750. Almost all states, if not all, have minimum wages set higher than that. So he wants to raise it to $15 an hour, which would just be a horrible idea because as with everything with the minimum wage, just because you're paying minimum wage workers at McDonald's more does not mean they're going to end up getting more money because then when they turn around and they go eat at Wendy's, well, the minimum wage workers at Wendy's, they now are getting paid more. And Wendy's has a result of having to drive up their price, which means the minimum wage McDonald's workers don't actually get any more money out of their wages. They're simply paying more and using more money. Anyway, prosecute union busting corporations so that labor can organize and negotiate fair wages. One thing I've noticed about RFK is that he's a very big union guy, and it's not something I'm a fan of at all. Uh, expand free childcare to millions of families with programs like that pioneered by the state of New Mexico. Drop housing costs by $1,000 per family. I would love to see how he's planning on dropping housing costs and make home ownership affordable by, by backing 3% home mortgages with tax-free bonds. When broke people can't buy real estate, we need policy change. There's systemic problems with our way of life. Capitalism isn't working. No, you're full of crap and you just can't do math. He has a bunch more of the points as well here. Um, reverse the chronic disease epidemic. That is with $3.7 trillion drag on families in the American economy. 
clean out the corruption in Washington, D.C., which funnels so much of our nation's wealth to giant corporations and billionaires, establish addiction healing centers on organic farms across the country, make student debt dischargeable in bankruptcy, and cut interest rates on student loans to zero, and cut drug costs by half to bring them in line with other nations. Um, <clears throat> the question I have, for example, number 14, cut drug costs by half to bring them in line with other nations, is when has it ever worked, price controls? When have they ever worked? When a federal government or any government institutes a price control, it just means that that product is either going to be unavailable or prices are going to start going up in other areas because you can't just say, well, we we'll use the example of drugs. Let's say a little bottle of 40 tablets of ibuprofen sells for $5. Then inflation starts happening. It starts selling for $8. And it's going to keep going up and the federal government says, well, you now, you know, ibuprofen company, you are not allowed to sell it for more than $10 a bottle. Well, inflation keeps happening to where these bottles are now worth $15, but their corporations aren't allowed to sell them for $10, so now they're going to start raising the price of all the other medications they sell because that's just the way it works. You can't just say um, that you can't charge anymore because either that's going to happen or they're just simply going to stop making the product. Moving on to Robert F. Kennedy's position on quote-unquote civil rights and racial healing. Uh, he has puts a big emphasis on that. He is a bit of a race baiter. Uh, that is certainly uh, certainly a fact. His first point, targeted community repair. Communities that were specifically targeted for destruction need to be specifically targeted for repair. During Jim Crow, black banks, businesses, hospitals, schools, and farms were targeted for destruction. Uh, Jim Crow ended like almost 100 years at this point ago, anywhere from 70 to 100 or so years ago, so I'm not sure what we're still harping about now. Uh, targeted community repair will be available to devastated communities across the country, not just black. The criteria will be around, not, will be around need, not skin color. So he says, just after talking about how, quote, racists knew that without these different black businesses, the black community had no chance of building wealth. In the next paragraph, he says, the criteria will be around need, not skin color. A little bit contradictory, and I think we know how these policies end up being implemented. Uh, prison reform. RFK Jr. will undo the legacy of the 1994 crime bill that disfavors African Americans. I'm going to go on a limb here. I don't know the 1994 crime bill by heart, but I'm going to go out on a big limb here and say that maybe more blacks are in jail than whites because blacks are 14% of the population approximately and make up 50% of the violent crime, where whites and other races make up the other 50%. Very, very, very much higher per capita uh, violent, violent acts, violent crime in the black community than there are in any other race. But maybe it's just that the, the system is racist. Uh, he'll seek early release for nonviolent offenders. Okay, also a bad idea. This is something Matt Walsh would have a really big problem with. Uh, because let's say you, you go into a liquor store. You don't, uh, you break into a liquor store, we'll say when it's, there's no employee in there. It's, it's after dark, but you break in and you steal five, you know, let's say you steal more. You, you destroy a bunch of property and you steal $50,000 worth of, of liquor and, uh, you know, wines, whatever else. You do that. That's not technically violent crime and it wouldn't always fall under a violent crime category depending on the method he used. He didn't attack anyone. Should that guy be let out early because of it? Should he not be at all sent to prison? At this point in our country, with our system the way it is, he probably would get a year, maybe two years in prison, probably get let off with probation, depending on the city. So, because that kind of stuff happens all the time. So, just because something's nonviolent doesn't mean it's a serious crime. If a drug dealer deals meth to someone who then ends up giving it to a kid and the kid dies, well, that's not technically a violent crime by the drug dealer. Should he be let off the hook and let out of prison early? Absolutely not. But the article, go, uh, the website goes on. He will reorient the prison system around his rebuil rehabilitation rather than punishment. The classic uh, liberal line, prison should be about punishment. His policy will be tough in the sense of keeping violent people where they can do no further harm, but generous in recognizing the fundamental desire of most human beings to live meaningful lives and contribute to society. Okay. A bunch of mumbo jumbo doesn't mean anything. And number three, police reform. Kennedy will reorient per police to serve, not occupy black communities. Again, I was told that this was going to be uh, targeted around need, not skin color. Uh, to keep neighborhoods safe rather than harassing their residents. Again, so much ambiguity, so much gray matter here. <clears throat> um, I can't dive into that all in this video. I'm trying to keep it uh, a shorter episode. 
The federal government will work with localities to change police culture because when is the federal government's law enforcement getting involved in local matters ever ended badly? With pro-community incentives, training and de-escalation and cooperation with neighborhood organizations. There's a bunch more. We'll end our section on Kennedy's civil rights right there. Moving on to something he's widely criticized for, which is his environment. Um, we will shift agricultural subsidies so as to encourage regenerative, regenerative practices, he says. Today, a new generation of farmers and ranchers is building soil, replenishing groundwater, and detoxifying land, all while producing just as much food as conventional farmers and earning a decent livelihood. Decent livelihood is quite the interesting phrase to use there. Incentivize the transition of industry to zero-waste cycles and clean energy sources. Protect wildlands from further development by curbing mining, logging, oil drilling, suburban sprawl. Curbing oil drilling, just what we need to do when we're paying. Uh, I'm here in uh, southwest Virginia right now. Not exactly a lot of big cities around here. Not a lot of high inflation and high prices compared to a lot of other places in the country. But gas is still almost three fifty a gallon where I am. And to say that we're going to curb oil drilling for the sake of the environment, not super comforting. Uh, we will restore the USDA and EPA to their proper role of protecting health and environment. He's a, he is a big environmentalist. That's another one of the big knocks on him. He he does a lot of that stuff. He buys into the whole liberal narrative of Mother Nature, the sun god, is going to burn us all up if we don't save the environment or something. As if there's anything humans can do other than like catastrophically alter society to really stop or change the supposed global warming global warming or climate change because most places in the world a lot of places in the world climate change is happening it's actually global cooling not warming but so they change it to climate change and then all that happens and the fact is the temperature changes around the world who cares it's always happened it always will okay so he's a big environmentalist we know that lastly his section interesting he has a campaign section on housing <clears throat> Consider these statistics. American homeownership is declining at the highest rate since the Great Depression. Uh, take home and play after inflation and taxes has fallen by 9%. At the current pace, by 2030, 60% of single-family homes will be owned by corporations. I'm not exactly sure where he's getting that figure. It's uh, not sourced. So what his idea is <clears throat> to make mortgages more affordable, tax-free, 3% government-backed mortgage bonds to bring the mortgage interest rate back to 2019 levels and even lower. Again, here's what he says. It's like having a rich uncle, Uncle Sam, who is willing to co-sign your mortgage. Because the financing will come from investors, the cost to taxpayers will be minimal. This measure alone will reduce monthly costs for the average home purchase by $1,000. It's simply not a good idea to get the government involved in something like that. There's, it's also just completely unconstitutional, which means it's against the law. Government is not supposed to do that. The federal government is not supposed to do that. As set up in the Constitution by the founders, nowhere in the Constitution is there found a right for Congress to spend on that. And then there's more stuff as well. We need to move on. So that's Robert F. Kennedy's position on just a few things. He's a he is a liberal. It's um funny because he's simultaneously he, he harps so much on limited government, yet at the same time he's so big government as well. He just has that in different places. Sometimes he wants big government in this section, limited government in this section. He just wants to move it around. Okay. Uh, toggling our topics here a little bit, let's talk about Nicole Shanahan. Uh, she is the lady that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has just picked to run as his vice president pick. Uh, she's a self-described progressive. She's a lawyer, um, which that, the fact that she's a lawyer and the fact that she is a uh, filthy rich uh, is likely why RFK picked her. She's from San Francisco. And uh, rather than try to give you a whole breakdown of who she is, because I'll be honest, I didn't, I didn't even know who she was um, other than a little bit I had heard about her from a couple of political shows leading up to yesterday when they announced. Uh, this is from The Independent. Quote, Shanahan may not have the same name recognition as, uh, uh, or star status as other possible choices. NFL provocateur Aaron Rodgers. Provocateur because he didn't want to take the vaccine. That's provocative. Former governor slash wrestler Jesse Ventura and self-help guru Tony Robbins, for example. But she has famous friends with deep pockets, ching, 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 I think we found our answer, uh, experience with enormous wealth and power, and a hard scrabble backstory that for the consummate, that makes for the consummate campaign catnip. The daughter of a Chinese immigrant, Shanahan has donated millions to reproductive research and other causes while racking up an unusual list of claims to fame. <clears throat> She's found and sold one startup, earned a fellowship at Stanford, given birth to a daughter, established a foundation, then and survived a headline-grabbing alleged love triangle between her Google founder, then-husband, and Elon Musk, just two of the major power players circling Shanahan's orbit. 
The Philanthropic Family Foundation invests in reproductive longevity, as in the science to increase the lifespan of a woman's fertility, criminal justice reform, and the climate crisis. Shanahan has shown a particular interest in legal rights throughout her career. While at Stanford, she worked on a project with the San Francisco District Attorney Office where she, quote, really doubled down on criminal justice reform, looking at police report data and determining if we could find bias by looking for patterns, she told people. Okay, so I don't really need to add anything to that. Basically, she's a big liberal. And uh, this is a good thing, in my opinion, actually, that Shanahan is the pick for Biden, or excuse me, pick for Kennedy, because I think this is, and we're going to get to it in just a second, but I think this goes to show and <clears throat> pretty much solidify and uh, the fact that she's going to be taking more from Biden voters than she will be from Trump voters, excuse me, Shanahan and Kennedy will be, because this pretty much destroys any notion in rhino slash establishment lean, even some conservatives who don't like Trump or aren't wild about them, such as myself, uh, pretty much wipes out any notion of Kennedy being this moderate, you know, kind of 60s Democrat, as they like to call him. Um, I think it's very obvious now that that's not the case, and she's going to be more appealing to the the Green Party sort of voters. You know, she, Jill Stein, Cornell West, those types. Um, <clears throat> and then they're, they're probably going to get that. Those others may have to drop out. It'll be Kennedy, Shanahan, Ticket, and then um, I don't think it's really going to get them more voters or anything, but I think it's going to cut down the Trump voters they take and increase the Biden voters they take. With that said, does Trump or Biden benefit more from RFK's presence in the race? In terms of the national vote, Trump currently leads Biden by 1.6 points nationally, per the real clear polling average when facing each other head to head. The score, Trump 46.6 to Biden's 45. I think it's important to note here, um, unless I miss my guess, throughout all of 2016 and all of 2020, Trump never led a single poll in which he led in the national popular vote. He lost the popular vote both times against Hillary and against Biden, though he, um, I believe, allegedly lost ground in 2020. Um, but right now, not only is he leading in some polls, he's leading by an average of 1.6 points in all the polls, pretty much all the, the credible polls out there. That's the average the RCP uses. However, here's the big kicker, answering the question of will RFK take more from Trump or Biden. When the two go head-to-head -head with RFK factored in, both candidate totals drop big time. Trump goes down from 46.6 to 40.7. Biden, excuse me, goes down to 45, from 45, all the way down to 35.3. So he has almost a 10-point drop while Trump takes about a 6-point drop. And Kennedy polls at a whopping 12.3%, which is a lot for an independent. Okay, <clears throat> here's the thing, though, I should say before we go any further. Just because someone answers a question from a pollster on the phone, who are you voting for? Just because they say, I'm voting for Jill Stein, I'm voting for Robert Kennedy, does not mean when they get to the voting booth they'll actually be willing to pretty much throw away their vote and vote for that guy. Um, we've seen in the past many times when third party candidates poll much higher than they end up being on election day. The only time in recent memory where a third party candidate has done really well is back, I believe in the 90s when Ross Perot uh, garnered, I think, is about 18% of the vote. Uh, I would be shocked if RFK gets that high today, because even with these candidates being very unliked, um, party affiliation is so strong, especially on the Democrat side and almost as much on the Republican side, um, that people don't like to say they're with a party, but people almost always vote for the Democrat or the Republican when given the option. So the debate has been going on for a while now, as to whether or not Robert F. Kennedy will take more votes from Biden or whether he takes them from Trump. And based on this stuff, to me, everything I've said already, it seems the obvious answer is Biden. Uh, Kennedy simply is not a conservative on any issues, on any issues other than some areas of government overreach, such as vaccines. But as I mentioned, he's all for government overreach in other areas. Uh, he's not anywhere as big a liberal as Biden, obviously. And some of his policies may even benefit the country. Not everything he does will be bad for the country, unlike 99.9% .9 of the stuff Biden does. But he's far more Democrat than a Republican, and if nothing else, it's in the name. Like it or not, the Kennedy name still carries some recognition and respect in the United States, mostly from Democrats, even some Republicans, though, that pine for the good old days of the 50s and 60s, when we all worked together, and the Republicans weren't radical, and the Democrats weren't radical, and we were all sitting around singing Kumbaya, which never happened, but here we are. But 
Kennedy has a lot of name recognition and he is still favorable with a lot of Democrats. There's a lot of people I would expect, even especially in the boomer and silent generation who remember the old days and pine for those days who will vote for Kennedy. And a lot of those people otherwise would be Biden voters and that's why I think that's the case. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. We're already being shadow banned on YouTube. So if you would like this specific video and then subscribe to the channel, that would be greatly appreciated and help us reach more people. Thank you for watching.